had been driving all night, and uh, by morning, he was still way far from his destination. So he decided to stop in the next town he came to, the next city, and park somewhere so he could quiet, so he could get an hour or two of sleep, and then continue on his journey. As luck would have it, the quiet place he chose happened to be one of the city's major jogging routes. A lot of runners would come by there. And so no sooner he settled back <clears throat> and began to snooze when a knock came out of his window. He looked out and saw a jogger running in place. He said, yes. The jogger said, excuse me, do you have the time? <clears throat> the guy looked <clears throat> at the car clock and he answered, it's 8.15. <clears throat> the jogger said thanks and left. He settled back again, trying to doze off. And there's another knock on the window, and another jogger says, Excuse me, do you have the time? Yes, it's 825. So the jogger said thanks and he left. And the man could see that the joggers passing by would be bothering him. See, it would just be a matter of time until another one disturbed him. So to avoid the problem, he got a pen and a paper out, he put a sign in the window saying, I do not know the time. Once again, he settled back to sleep, just dozing off. There's another knock at the door. And he said, sir, it's 8.45. <laughs> <laughs> a little delay on the reaction there. <laughs> Guy couldn't win. Mark chapter 6.31 says this. Then... Because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, come with me. Buy yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, this morning as we share these morsels from your word, that we trust and pray that you will guide the message into each heart and that you'll, that will have the effect that you want it to have. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So this was about, this is about rest, and the definition from a secular site, this is a secular definition from a site called the Mind Journal, which says rest is the time period in which one replenishes one's energy resources, both mentally and physically, to prepare one's body to perform the next set of activities with the desired fervor. It is not only about restoring the energy in our body, but also being able to get back to work with the same intensity. We do get drained mentally and physically when we have been working for long hours and actively using our energies. That was the definition. Unfortunately, this secular site doesn't recognize the need for spiritual rest, just physical and mental. But there is uh, exhaustion from physical work. There is uh, exhaustion from physical play. Uh, physical rest is needed, though, Jerry Summons played on a championship football team. They played on Tyrone's team, didn't they? And they, and they were champion players, weren't they, his, his boys? And when they came home after a game, were they full of energy or were they tired? Pretty tired, I imagine. Uh, but anyway, uh, there is mental fatigue and mental rest is needed. Sometimes you just have to get away from the problem you try to figure out when you get back to it with a fresh approach and you can see, oh, that's how it should work. And uh, there also is spiritual exhaustion. There's opposition from the enemy whenever you're trying to accomplish something for God. Spiritual struggles seem like an uphill battle and spiritual rest is what is needed. So we need rest. Not getting rest is harmful to the body. Uh, when our kids were little and we would go on vacation, I had to get back to work to get some rest. 
<laughs> Cause, cause the vacations weren't very restful uh, with the kids, and uh, so I had to get back to work so I could get some rest. Sunday afternoons, I fall asleep. Ministry is wearying, spiritually wearying. And this right here was happening before the text of Mark 31. This is going back to Mark, uh, the text was Mark 6.31. This is going back to the, to the 5th to 13th verse of Mark chapter 6. This is what was happening before he said, come away and get some rest. Verse 5, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. In verse 8, these were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Verse 10, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you, until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And verse 12 says, they went out and preached that people should repent. Verse 13, they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. So observe here that repentance was preached first. Repentance is the cure for the sickness of sin, and sin is the worst sickness that you can be afflicted with because it has eternal consequences. Then they drove out demons and healed the sick. Let's always remember that salvation comes first. Some ministries are just uh, totally built around deliverances and healings, but salvation should always come first. And when they came back, when they returned back to Jesus, they went out two by two. In verse 30, the apostles gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going, that they did not even have a chance to eat. He said to them, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away with him, verse 32, by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Jesus knew that they would need to rest because what he sent them out to do was a hard thing. He sent them out to preach repentance and they went all over the place and, uh, and they were able to cast out demons and lay hands and heal the sick. And he knew that would be wearying. So they would need, he had a sensitivity because he did this stuff himself. He knew it was wearying. I'm always exhausted after I preach a sermon. I asked my, my home church pastor if he was always exhausted and after preaching a sermon, he said, always. Pastor Wayne, he said, I'm always exhausted. So I'm not the only one. I thought maybe it's just me, but uh, other ministers are that way because ministry is wearying. Why? It's like being in a war and fighting an uphill battle. Uh, it's like fighting your way to capture a hill. And we as believers are bid and invited to go with Jesus to a quiet place and get rest. It's not only pastors that have spiritual wearying. Anybody, prayer warriors, people that, people that witness what we all should be doing, it's always a spiritual battle. Sometimes you go in a store and, and you see somebody that needs prayer and you pray for them. And it's a spiritual battle over a hill to get, because you, you feel a little weird about doing that. But do it. <laughs> do it. Just do it. And in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. So it's 
talking about rest today. You may have peace. In this world you have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So, why do we need rest? Why do we need that peace? You know, in the physical, we need rest. Your body re is designed to rebuild and replace cells when you're at rest. The body demands rest. If you don't decide you're going to get rest, you're going to fall asleep. I fall asleep watching television. Because that's the body demands sleep. Some people fall asleep when they're driving. Let's not do that. But it happens. We get fatigued. We get sleepy. We get tired. We get weary. Especially vintage like me. <laughs> You're older. You get, how about this for good English? You get a little bit more tired. Or <laughs> Take good English. Good enough, right? Our body needs to be at rest every so often so it can recover and rebuild, regenerate. It's important to our health. Babies sleep almost all the time because there's rapid cell division and growth and tissue growth in their bodies. They sleep almost all the time. I remember when I was born. And I wondered if I was a boy or a girl. And I looked down there, and I knew I was a boy because I had blue booties on. That's how you can tell. <laughs> God rested on the seventh day. He didn't need to rest. He's God. But he was making a statement, setting an example, setting a standard. When we rest spiritually, we lean on God. Resting in God is an act of trust. We are uh, revived when we make time for silence and solitude. Time to listen to the Lord in the still small voice in which he speaks to us. Matthew 11, 30, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, the King James says, heavy laden. I kind of like that language. And I will give you rest. <clears throat> See, that's the rest that comes from God. That's, that, that weariness and heavy ladenness is that spiritual exhaustion that comes. So we must come to Christ as our rest and rest in Him. That's what we were bid to do. It says, weary and burdened, weary and heavy laden, tired of this of the, these people were, had to battle against ceremonial law, ceremonial regulations that no one could keep. Burdened by a heavy load of sin. So we know that we're sinners and our sin causes a heaviness of guilt. In verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Rest for your soul is that spiritual rest that you need. It's a different kind of rest. And weariness of soul is a different kind of weariness. And for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, rest for your souls. Spiritual rest can only come from God. He says, come to me. That's where it comes from. In, in uh, Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Talking about God's rest. Talk about resting in God today. Leaning on the Lord is a matter of faith. The ultimate rest, Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse number 1. Therefore, since the promise of entering his 
rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. It was of no value to them because they didn't believe it. The gospel is proclaimed so that we may have the value of it. The value is eternal rest, our salvation, our being set free from the struggle against the war of the flesh, of sin and of death. Glorious freedom is God's rest. When we rest in God now, it's only temporary. The ultimate rest is still to come in eternity. Amen? Yeah. You're, a little, you're a little stingy on the amens today. Let me get my plaque out. <laughs> Just kidding. Now, we who have believed enter that rest. Just as God has said so, I declare on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world. That was number one. Number two, you can hear the gospel. You can even proclaim the gospel. Both, but without faith in the gospel, there will be no obedience to it. Faith leads to obedience. God expects obedience. You are not going to obey something that you don't wrap your heart around in faith. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I have to get my plaque up. All right, now I got that ready. Jerry, this says, can I get an amen? So I, you know, they make me beg for amens in here. So this is my begging. Anyway, by faith we enter into a communion with God through Christ. In that state, we enjoy pardon from sin, peace of conscience, joy in the Holy Spirit, rest from the bondage of sin, resting in God until we are prepared to rest with Him in heaven. And verse number four, for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in these words. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, in verse 7, God again set a certain day, calling it today. This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort, verse 11, to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. The example of disobedience, the disobedience came from the lack of faith. You're not going to obey something you don't believe in. A hardening of the heart in order to acquire the peace of God which transcends all understanding. One must wrap one's heart in faith around the truth of the gospel. Amen. I was going to make one that lights up, you know, hanging on here. And I'll push a button, it would light up, you know that one. I might still do that someday. I have to wear 
or stalking to the death. Hebrews 3, 13, uh, 3, 12 to 19. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But exchange, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they that had rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for forty years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see, this is verse 19, that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. Unbelief, then, is the enemy of rest, of God's rest. The unbelief will keep us from entering God's rest. Looking at our own life, see to it that unbelief doesn't creep in, turning us away from God. That happens. You have to cling to your faith. Number two, encourage one another. Encouragement of other believers keeps us from becoming hardened by sin. Number three, hold our conviction to the very end. It is possible to let go of conviction and it's possible to lose your salvation. The Bible speaks of the names being uh, taken out of the book of life. And number four, hold on to our faith in the gospel. The good news that Christ has come that the ultimate sacrifice has been made, that by believing in him as Lord and Savior, and that by living for God, we'll be able to enter into God's rest. We will hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you stand? Lord, it's been our delight and our joy to be in your presence today. To bring needs before you, Lord God. To pray for people. To praise you, Lord, for the way your torch started to turn this country around. We pray that will continue, Lord. We pray for each person in the house today, Lord, yes. as they go their separate ways, that the blessings of God will be upon us, Lord. We pray that we'll all be moving toward the ultimate rest, Lord, and that we'll be able to help other people to be ready to enter into that rest, Lord. Yes. So be with each one today as we go our separate ways. Bring us back safely again next time we meet. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Say hello to